So in this lecture, we're going to take a look at a different type of analysis and that short circuit analysis. That is, if there's a, a fault on the circuit, such as a tree falling into the line that results in a really large current, how do we calculate that type of a current? And what I would normally do if I were in class, I would play some uh, videos. Uh, there's some YouTube links I've provided for you. Um, instead of doing that here, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just let you guys take a look at this on your own. And it's, it's pretty impressive just how much, uh, um, how much noise and flashes are, are associated with these different types of events. And it just kind of goes to show just how much power there is in these, these distribution circuits we're talking to about even at the medium voltage level. So uh, take a look at some of these, uh, particularly in this first um, video here, you can note that the fault actually occurs at um, one minute 19 into the video, but there's faults in all these different sections right here. And I'm sure there's other videos you can look at as well that would have faults on medium voltage distribution circuits. So we'll start off by just talking a little bit uh, in general about, you know, short circuits, you know, what kind of characterizes them for distribution circuits. And then I want to review some bus impedance matrix concepts in case you haven't seen this before in a class. And then talk about how we can take a circuit and represent it by a Thaben equivalent at the point of the fault. And then since we're working on distribution circuits and since these circuits are unbalanced and we don't have three phases at every bus, we have to look at a more generalized sort of model rather than using a um, kind of a, just a balanced three phase model. And that's what I'm gonna to refer to as a phase component model. And we'll talk about um, how we can create a three phase Z bus from this, which was we're, we're gonna need for doing this fault analysis. And the second part, I'm going to go over the different fault types and we're going to be focused on single phase, two phase and three phase faults. And then I just want to make a few comments about the relationship between what I would call phase components and symmetrical components. And then the last part, part C, I'll go through a few worked examples. So I kind of use the, the term short circuit and faults interchangeably. Uh, faults are generally more what the utility people would refer to these events as. And these can be caused by a variety of different things. Um, animal contact is actually one major cause of faults. Uh, particularly when you consider that when you have a device like a, a transformer and the transformer has a bushing on it, and this is actually the hot conductor, Keep in mind that the transformer casing is grounded. And so if you get some type of an animal in here and they poke their nose um, on, the, on the top of that bushing and they're sitting on the uh, transformer tank, which is grounded, and they're, and they're gonna basically form a path to ground and, and not only be electrocuted, but, but cause a short circuit, which is gonna um, maybe result in an outage for somebody. Uh, other sorts of things that could occur would be tree branches falling into lines. Now, it's not so much, if you have two adjacent wires, it's not so much a branch falling um, across two wires that are hot, but the tree actually would push like a phase into a neutral, let's say, or push one phase into another phase because tree branches have actually kind of a high impedance associated with them. Uh, vehicle accidents, common cause of faults where somebody runs into a pole and knocks a pole over. Insulation can be contaminated um, by pollutants or salt. And so those would actually fail. And you could also have insulation fail. And so when we talk about having a transformer that's overloaded, those windings cook, it'll basically cook the insulation. And so the, the windings actually start to short circuit against each other and that could actually cause a fault. So a lot of different causes of, of these different types of events. And when these events occur, then we're gonna have devices upstream such as fuses and circuit breakers. They're gonna be used to isolate the faults. 
This is going to be the topic of the next lecture, which is going to be done by uh, John Guida. And he'll get into more of that in detail, but we need some way of quantifying the magnitude of these events in terms of amperes. And the reason we need to have this information is we need to set our protection relays. We need to come up with fuse sizes for doing what we call the, the protection and, and the protection coordination between the different types of protection devices. And so we need to have some, some values that we could use for this um, engineering analysis. Something else we can get from the short circuits is we can also determine what the amount of voltage sag is gonna be on unfaulted buses as a result of the fault, which we'll get into this a little bit as well. The parameters that we're gonna use for this are very, very similar to what we would use for power flow. The big difference though is when we have a power flow, we can assume at the top of the feeder that we have a regulated voltage bus. In the case of a fault, the line regulator obviously is not going to be able to regulate voltage anymore. The voltage is basically going to collapse due to the large current. And the, the fault event occurs in such a fast time frame, the tap doesn't have time to change anyway. So what we need to have is we need to have a model for the power system that includes the net impedance all the way to the generation source. And so this is really the big difference between short circuit in power flow analysis, we still use the same wide models as before, overhead and cable, et cetera. But what we have to add to this, which we don't need for running power flow, is we need to have the substation transformer and transmission system impedance. And a lot of times this is provided as one set of values. And I provide those set of values actually in the project spreadsheet. So, as far as what actually causes a fault on a particular distribution circuit, it just depends on the characteristics of the circuit. In the short book, he was involved, he talked about a study he was involved in for Electric Power Research Institute, where they're trying to kind of characterize the, the different types of events. And for this one area, you know, they found that lightning was a big cause. Because if you have overhead line and you have, say, like, um, say like a neutral and maybe adjacent phases. If you have lightning nearby and say it gets close, it's gonna induce electromagnetic energy in those lines, which is gonna cause an overvoltage, which causes um, failure in the insulation between adjacent phases or between phase and neutral. And so you can, get a, you can get a fault due to that. As I mentioned, tree contact, there's animal contact, uh, equipment failure, wind, um, the wind either knocking poles down or blowing conductors into each other. Construction, if people are doing construction nearby, a lot of times they actually have a, a backhoe they're using. They might actually dig into an underground cable and cause a fault that way. A lot of different types of faults like that. And then what's kind of interesting is if you look at this other category, it's actually the largest, the one with the, the largest incidents. The reason being, a lot of times we go out into the field after a short circuit has occurred, and we never know exactly what caused it. And this is not really a good thing because then if we don't know what caused the fault, then we're kind of powerless to prevent it from happening again, right? So you really want to know what caused the fault so you can you can fix it so it doesn't keep reoccurring. As far as the number of phases a fault would involve um, from the EPRI study that um, short was referring to in his textbook, basically you see that most of these faults are single phase to neutral. That's really the main type of fault would, which would occur. And that's why we kind of spend a lot of time looking at single phase faults. You've also got phase to phase faults. You got phase going to ground. Um, actually a three phase fault, either ungrounded or on ground, it actually has the lowest incidence. But why would we still look at three phase faults? Well, it turns out that even though single line of ground faults are the most common, three phase faults are generally the worst case. Three phase faults, generally we get the most fault current, not all the time, but a lot of times. And so given that we wanna see, you know, see the bounds of how the fault current can actually vary, 
a lot of times we'll, we'll still do like a three phase analysis, even though it's a, it's a very rare type of a fault. So in order to understand how to do fault analysis, you, you need to have an idea of how a bus impedance matrix works and what it is. Um, because that's kind of the, the, the type of information that we're going to use for, for doing fault analysis. And what a bus impedance matrix is, is, you know, maybe you, know, you took this material before, you know, you can think about this as being the inverse of a Y bus or an admittance matrix. But basically what a bus impedance matrix does is it relates injected currents at each bus to voltage. So Z bus is equal to, V bus is equal to Z bus times I bus. And if I'm going to write this out, I've got to use matrices for this. And so actually V bus is a matrix, Z bus is a matrix, I bus is a matrix. And for this simple example where I have three buses, uh, I have an internal voltage E1, and I have these branch impedances Z10, 12, and 23. Then what I'm going to have is I'm going to have V bus, which is going to be three by one, consisting of V1, V2, and V3, and is equal to Z bus which is a three by three matrix times I bus, which is a three by one. And so what I one would represent is I one would be the current that we would inject into bus one. That's what I one would be. And note the notation is set up where it's current going into the bus. Usually we think about fault current going out, but these currents are injected currents. And so, what I'm doing in this case is I, if I'm showing um, branch values, um, these would be the values that we would get from our line modeling equations. I'm putting a little overscore under those. So you don't get these values here confused with the bus impedance values. The bus impedance values, I don't put a little um, bar over. And so anyway, um, this is just some concepts of involving Z bus matrix. Now, if you're working with this type of a circuit, normally what you would have for your source model is some sort of a voltage behind an impedance. This would be very, very common. But if we wanna do our modeling with respect to bus number one, a lot of times it's more convenient to take this voltage behind an impedance and then convert into a current injection with the parallel impedance. This is what's sometimes referred to as a Thevenin and Norton equivalent transformation. And so this internal uh, voltage would be transformed into a current, and then this impedance would be put in parallel with that current. And if we wanna find the values for Z bus, say I wanna find Z bus for this particular simple circuit here, there's a couple different ways I can do that. One would be is I could use uh, what we call admittance matrix building algorithm. That's probably what a lot of you have seen before if you've had like an undergraduate power systems class. So this is one way you could do that. However, if you have a distribution circuit that has a lot of buses associated with it, inverting that admittance matrix is a difficult operation. Um, it's it's kind of kind of cumbersome to do something like that. And so what we typically do for distribution instead is when we need impedance matrix entries, we use a more direct technique. And, and the technique I'm going to talk about here is to use what's called a current injection technique. So basically, if you look at the definition of each term in that impedance matrix Zij, Zij is going to be the change in voltage at bus I associated with a change in current injected at bus J. And so if I think about that injection as just being one amps at angle zero degrees, that if I were inject at bus J one amp at zero degrees, then the change in that voltage at bus I would be the Zij term in a bus impedance matrix. And so it, it's gonna be a lot easier, as you'll see for distribution, in order to use this type of technique rather than just inverting a admittance matrix. So for this particular circuit that I showed you, for this particular circuit right here, 
I claim that the Z bus matrix is, is shown right here. All right, here's my Z bus matrix. I got it's three by three. It's symmetric around the diagonal, so I can take the transpose. You know, this term's the same as this term. This term's the same as this term. And what you should see here is you should see a pattern. And the pattern would be is that if I'm starting at bus one, if I basically move up toward the source and I sum up all the impedance, then that's going to be the diagonal entry. The diagonal entries correspond to summations of impedance. And then what the diagonal entries correspond to is what's the common impedance that the two buses would, would have in common with each other. Okay, and we'll see in just a little bit where this comes from. But what you can actually do is you can actually figure out for distribution due to the radial nature of these distribution circuits, you can usually figure out these impedance matrix terms as needed by inspection, all right? So let's just kind of verify that this is gonna be the case and we're going to use this one amp injection method. So let's suppose I've got this circuit and I wanna figure out what, um, Z22 is, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and inject one amp and I'm gonna look at that change in voltage at bus number two. If I inject one amp here at bus number two, then the current's gonna flow, it's gonna be flowing through here. And what I'm gonna be seeing for the change in the voltage at bus number two is I'm going to see that this is going to be Z10 plus Z12. Okay, so that matches up with what I've got in my little example here. Now, what if I were going to go ahead and inject um, that same amount of current at bus number three? Well, what I, that current would actually flow then through the simple loop. And what I would see for the change in voltage is gonna be Z23 plus Z12 plus Z10, which is what I've got right here. If I look at the off diagonal terms, and let me um, go ahead and erase this real quick. If I were going to inject, say, current at bus number three, and I want to figure out what Z23 is, then basically, if, if I inject a current through here and it's going to flow through this loop, then basically what I'm going to see for the change in voltage at bus number two is going to be Z10 plus Z12. which is basically what I've got two, three, which is gonna be this term right here. So this is getting a little marked up, I know, but you can try this on your own. And if you're not really convinced, I mean, and if you use like Y bus building before, you know, go ahead and build a Y bus and invert it. And then you could show that you can actually get the same numbers for a radial circuit with no loops by using this one amp injection method. So let's suppose um, we're trying to do a fault calculation, then how are we gonna do these calculations now? Well, let's suppose I'm wondering you do a fault at bus number two, and let's kind of forget, bus number three is hanging out here somewhere, but it's not gonna play into the solution in this case. So let's suppose I wanna do a fault calculation at bus number two. How would I do something like this? And what I meant to say is note, this is a linear circuit. Um, what, you, what you would do in this case is you could actually solve this if you wanted to using circuit analysis. But another way you can approach this and the way we usually do this for power system calculations is we would create the Thevenin equivalent circuit as seen at the bus that we're gonna apply the fault. 
So given that this is a linear circuit, what I can do is I could replace everything in here off to the left is I can replace that by a Thevenin equivalent, which is going to consist of a voltage behind an impedance. The Thevenin equivalent voltage is going to be the, the voltage I'm going to have at this particular bus before the fault is actually turned on, which is sometimes what we refer to as the open circuit voltage. The open circuit voltage in this case would actually just simply be E1. And then the Thevenin equivalent impedance I'm going to have is going to be an impedance that I'm going to see here at bus number two when I kill off my sources. And if you have a current source, basically you kill off a current source by setting this current equal to zero. And what I'm going to see for the impedance is going to be Z10 plus Z12. All right. So basically, I can, I can take the information and um, I've got for the circuit, and I can get Z7 and also voltage seven in. Now, if I've already got the bus impedance matrix, then where would I get that seven equivalent value from? Well, this seven equivalent value is just simply gonna be Z22, okay? So if I go back to here, basically Z22 is the seven impedance. For any bus I'm gonna do these calculations at, um, the seven equivalent values are just going to be a value that's going to be on the diagonal, either for bus one, two, three, et, et cetera. And so if I have Z bus, I basically have all these seven equivalent impedances already calculated out for me. And so now if I were going to just look at the fault current, well, the fault current is just going to be the seven and voltage divided by the seven impedance. All right. Um, now let's suppose we're working with uh, more complex examples. And let's suppose I'm working on the circuit problem and I don't have any specific information about what the pre-fault voltage is for the circuit. Um, I normally would get something like that running a power flow. And so usually I would get the seven voltage from a power flow. That would just be the power flow solution. Normally when we do short circuit analysis, we run the power flow first. Let's suppose you didn't have a power flow result. What would you do? Well, pretty good assumption generally is just to assume that this voltage E1 is just at nominal. It's one per unit. So you could either be working this in per unit or you can work in this in ohms. Um, it would be a nominal line to neutral voltage um, for the particular circuit. Um, but when, when would um, the seven voltage not automatically be E1? Well, the seven voltage is not automatically E1 whenever we have any loads, all right? So if I were to take this simple circuit and I had load currents, you can see now we're gonna get voltage drops across all these branch impedances. And so this voltage, um, V2 under um, before I apply the fault, it can't be E1. It's going to be some value less than E1. Same with V3. V3 is going to be some value less than E1. You know how much lower depends on the the value of the of the current. And so, let's suppose I didn't have a a power flow. What well, what would you do? Well, a lot of times a common practice would just be to ignore these load currents. Because if you're going to do the fault calculation, I'm looking at a fault right here. This fault current is so much greater usually than the load current that even if we had the load current, we really wouldn't make that much difference in the results. And so if we don't have this information about our loads ahead of time, we just usually ignore load and just do our fault current calculations without considering any load that would be on the circuit um, before the fault would occur. So it kind of depends, you know, if we were doing more complex modeling, we would go ahead and include it. But if I don't have that information, if I don't have the power flow, you just basically assume that all the loads are zero. And a lot of times you just assume this is at some nominal voltage. All right. So what makes things complicated now is the fact that not everything's three phase. 
uh, we've talked about in class, we're going to have two phase sections, we're going to have one phase sections. And so maybe at the top of the circuit, this would start off by as being three phase, right? So I could actually have a three phase source. Um, it has internal impedances of ZAA1, ZBB1, ZCC1. Um, maybe we don't have any particular mutual coupling information at this particular point. Um, but what you're going to see later on is you're going to have like two phase sections, and you're going to have single phase sections. All right. So what we're going to have associated with say like the source model is we're going to have a three by three matrix. What we're going to have for the, uh, say that we have a three phase line here, we're going to have a three by three matrix relation. Maybe these mutual coupling terms are, are not going to be the same, all right? So that could complicate our analysis, the fact that ZAC, which is a mutual impedance term, is not going to be the same as ZAB. Um, then what you're going to have is you might have two phase segments, and this is going to be modeled by a two by two primitive impedance matrix, and you have a single phase section. And this is going to be modeled just simply by one by one by one. Um, Something else you're also going to see, too, is the number of nodes we have is not necessarily going to be three times the number of buses. Now, a bus would just be like a connection point between two, two feeders, right? And so you, in this circuit, you're going to have like bus one, bus two, bus three, and bus four. There's four different points, for example, that we could place load. However, as far as circuit analysis is concerned, then this particular circuit right here actually has um, a different number of nodes than simply four by four by three. There's not three nodes for each different bus. And so at bus number one, we have nodes 1A, 1B, 1C. At bus number two, we have 2A, 2B, and 2C. But at bus number three, we just have nodes 3A and 3B. At bus four, we just have node 4B. And so from a circuit analysis viewpoint, um, the number of buses doesn't necessarily give us the complete picture. We have to know how many phases we have at each bus. And then from a circuit analysis viewpoint, if we're modeling everything in three phase, we actually then have to kind of start keeping track of these specific nodes um, that are kind of a combination of the bus and the, and the phase information. Later on, when we get to working with this other program that we're going to use for uh, distributed energy resource analysis, OpenDSS, OpenDSS specifically works in terms of node values. In a program like Millsoft, you're, you're kind of working a little bit more with bus values and you have a little thing you click in the upper left hand corner for the number of phases. But you'll see later on for programs like OpenDSS that are more generalized, we actually work in, in terms of these nodes. And so this sort of model here, where I don't have three phase for everything, that I have two phase components, I have single phase components, and I'm putting this all together into a circuit model. This is what I would refer to as a phase component model. And the thing of it is, this is, this is what we're going to need for distribution. For transmission, we can get by using symmetrical components. For transmission, we always have three phases for each bus. But we don't have three phases for each bus for distribution. So now when we start talking about coming up with the impedance matrix, uh, now when we talk about V bus and I bus, then we have to talk now in terms of these nodes. As you can see, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different nodes for this particular circuit. You'll have similar um, nodes that are used for the um, current bus matrix. And then what Z bus is now going to look like is it looks like this right here, where this is symmetric. So I didn't show the lower triangle terms. So can you see a pattern here? Again, I'm always going to be asking you this. Can you see a pattern here? Could you actually build this on your own without inverting a Y bus? And I'm going to claim that you could use this one amp injection method 
And basically that these diagonal terms here are basically just a simple summation of the impedances going back toward the source. Whereas these off diagonal terms are the terms that are in common between two buses. And so if we're talking about, um, this is gonna be associated with bus one with respect to bus two, this is the change in voltage of bus one with respect to change in current junctions of bus two. Basically what this reflects is these are the impedance terms that are common with, with both the buses. And so what you can kind of do is you can take some of this, these concepts I talked about for the simple case where I just simply had per phase um, before, and you can apply them also to this particular sort of circuit. Um, and, and coming up with all these different terms. Now, if we're going to be working out these um, fault problems for distribution, you, you might be thinking, well, gosh, you know, this is a lot of work. You know, I got to come up with a lot of different terms for my bus impedance matrix. However, if all I'm interested in just is just kind of working an example out where I want the fault current at bus number three, well, really all I need to do is just get this sub matrix, right? And so a lot of times when you're doing fault analysis, you could just simply derive just the terms you need. You don't have to be building an entire Z bus every time. You just get the terms you need, uh, either using this one amp rule or using, using inspection. And again, what you can do is if you're gonna do the analysis, then you can just do this in terms of a Thevenin equivalent. And so again, if I'm talking about bus number two, uh, what I can do is I can basically take this circuit right here and just basically model everything to the left by a voltage behind an impedance. Now it's a little bit more complicated in this case because now we're working in terms of generalized three phase. And so I'm gonna have a voltage E, A, E, B, and E, C where these magnitudes may not be the same. You may not have exactly minus and plus 120 degree facius between these voltages. And then these impedances here are basically going to be the, the summation, the impedances working back toward the source, which is actually going to match up with, um, for bus number two, with, with this three by three sub matrix. All right. So, a lot of terminology here, but I think when you work with this, you'll start to see the patterns and it'll make a little bit more sense once you start to see the, the numbers um, it, you know, as far as doing this sort of calculation. But what we're going to do now, what I'm going to do in the next video segment is given that I'm going to do fault calculations at a given bus, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this generalized um, three bus seven equivalent, three phase seven equivalent circuit. And then we're gonna go through all the different cases for how to do like a single line to ground fault, line to line fault um, and, and three phase faults in, in just a little bit.